Welcome to the Pope on Film. I am Bunny Williams, and with me is... I am the Pope in question. My name is May Reverend May Lynn. I am the founder of the Church of Ed Wood, which is an actual thing worth a Google. Happy Buntober, everyone, which is uh, my co-host, my partner in crime, Bunny's birthday month. So he gets the reins to the show for a while. And so last week we saw David Cronenberg's second movie, Crimes of the Future. And I said, man, this has to be the worst Cronenberg movie. But this week, surgery is the new sex, Bunny. Yes. So this is episode 440 uh, of the podcast, which means technically that there have been 439 episodes before this one. uh, And why would I make that up? That would be weird. Just trust us. This is the 440th episode. Uh, Very excited today. I've got a very passionate monologue that I think you'll like. Then we'll take a little break. I've got a Steve's Historic Approximations and a lot to talk about on running out the meter. And I've got a lot for this week and our film, 2022's Crimes of the Future. It, It... this week's movie, man, it's like it's like if um, George Lucas made a new movie and called it American Graffiti, but it was about the war in Yemen. Yeah. You know, like, why would you do that? Why would you do this? It just pisses me off. It really upsets me. That he just recycled a title from another movie he already did. It's not a sequel, a requel, a reboot. It's just, hey, I like this title. I'm going to use it twice. And it upsets me so much. But uh, that's for... Well, the I think that was a, a... Like I mentioned, I think, the other week, I think that that's just a, a publicity headline grab. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because it, it, it got a couple of articles done on him. Yeah. It, it, it upsets me. It just upsets me. And his last couple of movies didn't do so well, so... Yeah. What? Are you saying you're not a fan of Existence? Existence I kind of like. I kind of like this movie. Fucking okay, we'll get to this movie. We'll get to this movie. I'm not a fan. But I didn't like Cosmopolitan. That was fucking horrible. I never saw that. I never saw that. Yeah. But to be fair, everyone loves uh Robert Battinson now. Yeah. And I feel like Cronenberg was the first person to take a chance at him and say, Hey, you are a good actor. I think it was a, a an incredibly smart move on Robert Pattinson's so on on his behalf. I mean, like you don't get much further away from Twilight and Edward Cullen, yeah. than doing a Cronenberg flick. Absolutely, absolutely, that was a smart. Uh... And apparently, he's told Kristen Stewart about it. <laughs> yeah, right. Bunny! Yes. According to some random chud on Apple Podcasts, this show is nothing but left leaning <laughs> trash. Yep. Hooray! We're left leaning trash. Yep. And I'd, I'd like to think that we make good on that review. Oh, yes. This is, this show is some pretty left leaning. Trash. Donald Trump is I, an I, idiot. I don't think we're leaning. We're flat out laying down, man. Nice. We're not left leaning. We're left laying. Yeah. Yes, Mal. Is there something that you wanted to bring up? Because you're standing right here off to the side. And um, what's up? Miso had the zoomies. Okay, the cat had the zoomies. And we're going around, and I had baby in the room too. 
He was trying to attack him and then jumped all around over the walls. Spilled my coffee. And now your inhaler might smell like coffee for a while. Uh, you you spilled coffee on my inhaler. Okay. Okay. I didn't research. You just made a caffeinated inhaler. Congratulations. Oh, Congratulations. It got so extremely close to the Wi-Fi though, and then uh, if anything, you probably made it faster ah, yeah, by covering it in coffee. Yeah. So, wow. Now we have fiber-rich Vive gig internet. Yeah, like they're always telling us about. Yeah. So this podcast isn't left-leaning trash. It is left-laying-down trash. Donald Trump is an idiot and a con artist. And if you voted for him, you're gullible. And you would most definitely fall for the Jedi mind trick. Uh, because a reality show host and part-time rapist tricked you into voting against your best interest. However, I like to think that in our own decidedly non-libertarian way, because a libertarian is just a conservative who smokes weed. Yes. I'd like to think that we also give it, that we also give it to Biden and the Dems almost as much as we do the right. Yeah. Not as much, but almost as much. Not equally. We don't attack both sides equally because right now in the year of our Lord, 2022, one political party wants to round up all the gays and the trans people, all the foreigners and the minorities, strip away their rights and execute them and then burn the U.S. Constitution and install a violent power hungry dictator while the other side is just stupid. Yes. We in a sexual. That's the thing about Biden and such, you know, like they have to actually do something in order to be able to attack them. Yeah. Yeah. And so rarely do they do anything. Yeah, like I'm all for helping those less fortunate, but in order to change things to narcissists, society you actually have to try yes and change and the dems just don't want to seem to change anything at all i mean joe biden could make abortion legal right now if he wanted to but he doesn't so he isn't right and this past week the headline screamed biden pardons people with weed possession and all that but most of the people that are currently incarcerated for marijuana possession are being held at the state level and not at the right. federal level. And he pardoned federal prisoners. In fact, in Mississippi this summer, their state Supreme Court upheld a life sentence for a man who was convicted of having less than two ounces of pot. Yes. Two ounces. Biden didn't save that person. Biden only you know, pardon people at a federal level and not the state level. And Biden's edict does nothing for those people. And again, just like a, a abortion, Joe Biden could release all of those people right now if he wanted to. He could make legal, he could make weed legal right now if he wanted to, but he doesn't, so he won't. Yes. And And now the news is saying that few Americans have gotten the new COVID booster shot ahead of the projected upcoming winter surge. Right now, only 4% of eligible Americans have gotten their booster. Gee, I wonder why. I wonder why people aren't getting the booster. Well, maybe it's because our elderly president is on national TV telling people the pandemic is over. Yeah. No, it's not. You've Freaking senile jackass. I'm just sick and tired of old white men running our entire nation. Old, rich white men. Yes. You know? Uh-huh. Old, rich, top 10% of all wealth in the nation. Senile, old, white guys almost exclusively run this supposed democracy. I'm just... I, I I hate that. But I also have a hard time saying that because when I say that, it's sort of, you know, uh, like uh, breakfast at Tiffany's. <laughs> it's the one thing that Republicans and I have in common. Yes. Like the song Breakfast at Tiffany's. 
is is what I was. I, I used to sing. Uh, it, I would sing the song "Breakfast at Tiffany's" at karaoke, but I would change the movie to Plan Nine from Outer Space. Okay. And I said, "What about Plan Nine from Outer Space?" So it it was a lot of fun. It call me crazy, but this is what I think. I think that if you're deemed too old and too decrepit. To work at a McDonald's, you should also be too old to be the president of the United freaking States. Yes. I 100% believe this. Biden's too old. Biden's too old. But it's difficult to say that out loud without sounding like another hey, hey, angry, bigoted, America first a hole Trump supporter because Biden is too old. Biden is senile. That's straight out of a Sean Hannity transcript, you know? Yeah. But it's true. Yeah, it, I I did some I did some looking into it's, this. It's you a know? stutter. Didn't you get the memo? It's a stutter. Yeah. Stutter. You know how old Joe Biden is, Bunny? Uh when like he nine or some shit, isn't he about to be ninety? 79 he's about to be 80 and they don't want to make a big deal about it because oh. it, like specifically people within the white house are trying to like not make a big deal about the president's birthday because that's a huge number and it's going to scare people so they're trying to pretend like he doesn't have a birthday this year like Fred Schuster told me about his age yeah he's 79 Wait. joe biden is so old when he was born casablanca just came out yes Casa freaking Blanca. That's effing old. Yes. Biden is as old as here's looking at you, kid. <laughs> but here's where we differ, uh, where our podcast, our left leaning trash podcast, differs from the Hannity's and the Joe Rogan's of the world. All of the Republicans will be like, yeah. Biden's way too old. Biden's senile. And it's like, yes, I agree with you, Republicans, but your guy's effing old, too. Yeah. Trump is also way too old to be freaking president. He is only 40 months younger than Biden. And really, that's not much younger than great, great grandpa Joe. No. So I looked it up. I looked it up. Okay. So, so Trump is exactly as old. I was trying to figure out ways to say, oh, Trump is this old, Biden is this old. So this is a film podcast. Trump is exactly as old as the as Frank Capra's film, It's a Wonderful Life. And you know who was in that? Alfalfa before he was killed. Yes, this is true. That is equally way too old to be president. We've got It's a Wonderful Life saying Casablanca is too old. When you look at it that way, okay. Yeah, Biden's <coughs> old. So is Trump, though. <coughs> to put it in a cinematic perspective, I'm really proud of this. Okay, okay, Bonnie? I'm really proud of this. Biden is as old as the movie Casablanca. Uh... Trump is as old as the Marx Brothers parody A Night in Casablanca. Okay. Those are both too old. Yes. Get rid of them all. Clean sweep. And it's not just those two fossils, too. And I'm really sorry about this. It's not those, it's not just those two fuddy duddies. Bernie Sanders was born. The same year as the first appearance of Captain America. <laughs> Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? That is ridiculous. And in a recent speech, Bernie Sanders warned Democrats, quote, not to focus solely on abortion ahead of the midterms. Bernie, what the fuck are you talking about? I don't think that the, I don't think that helps anybody. 
Bernard Sanders. We'll finish the thought. What? Don't solely do, but then do what? We should be pointing out the fact that the Republicans took away a woman's right to choose and focus on that. Oh, it's yeah. Like, but what, what do you want to focus on? The jobs numbers? That's not going to do anything. Do you want to focus on how gas is 40 cents cheaper now? That's not going to help. We've got an issue that can that we can ride the entire way home. Mm -hmm. Like either help us or shut your mouth. I love Bernie Sanders. He's an anthropomorphic beef jerky stick, and he's, he needs to get his, <laughs> he needs to get his shit together. All of these rest home rejects need to take their hands off of the steering wheel of the United States of America. Um, it, it, and here's the thing I hear from a lot of, of people, uh, that, oh, you're being ageist, right? But I, I feel that the term ageist, you don't really hear that about old non white people. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. I got that if one. there's an, it, 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 an old black woman. An old Mexican, an old Asian person, an old white person. Whoa, whoa, you're being ageist. <laughs> so I have the I have a problem with the problem of ageism. Is there a problem, Mel? No. But did you get anything off of the burger? I, I ordered a baconator. I didn't get anything off of it. Okay. I kept everything on. Okay. Here you go. We got Wendy's. Yeah. Ah. I, I I never got over the fact that like oh Dave Thomas, the founder of Wendy's, for a while he made himself the Colonel Sanders of Wendy's fast food. He was yes, everywhere. He you saw him everywhere. He was the face of Wendy's. And And he was a cute, sweet old guy. Yeah. But he had the same name as as a famous Canadian actor and comedian. Yes. And that always bugged me. Yes, he did. It's like if all of a sudden you see, hi, welcome to Carl's Jr. I'm elderly white Christian founder Eugene Levy. <laughs> you know, like that's weird. But anyway... Age limits would solve everything with our po political system, but no one will vote for that. So here's my plan to solve things, Bunny. I have a plan to solve everything. All American politicians will be, fo will be forced to take the presidential physical fitness test. <laughs> You want to be a senator? Okay, Orrin Hatch. 92-year-old Orrin Hatch. 20 push-ups, 20 sit-ups. Do the monkey bars, and then I want to see you climb this freaking rope. Oh my god, right? I, 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 I have a bit of a different take here. Hey, okay. what do you got? That... If after the after their four year term, the country is not in a significantly better place, then we just shoot that president and go on to oh. the next one. My God, see, listen, I was really thinking like public hanging, public execution style. So, funny, thank you for saying it. Yeah, you. Thank you. I was thinking just. Just every four years, uh, well, death race. Like, if we did a public execution type thing, we can do it in an arena. People can buy tickets. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And then the profits could go towards something, you know, to improve the rest of okay. the world. Like, America or something. You know what I'm saying? I just had like, one. Like, profit uh, profitable. Profitable. So that, profitable. That's profitable. how they say so it in England. we can donate that to, like, charity or help yeah. in hunger or something. Because I guarantee you all those motherfuckers. Uh, and we sell, you, you want to be a rich person and you want to see this execution? You have to pay, like, $10 million. Oh, 
you broke you broke all right here you found a penny on the street cool here you go you get a seat right up front bitch because yeah. you're the ones that are affected the most there i'm thinking of now of so many cinematic ways that we can handle this uh this is what we do for every single solitary senate race uh we don't vote on them we make them saw it out no not hunger games no we saw it like a uh, two uh congressmen wake up in a dirty bathroom hello senators oh my god I want to play a game. And it's like, hey, <laughs> cut off a pound of your butt meat and put it on this <laughs> put it on this drawbridge to raise the port colors. And then something that we do every four years, kind of like leap year or elections and shit. Uh it, it's it's essentially like we can plan it ahead of time, right? So we have people pay money to be able to vote on the next way that they die. You know, and and again, it would be based on income. So if you're a rich person and you want to have any say in that, you have to pay X amount of dollars as opposed to like the sliding scale where, oh, no, you're a poor person. You can vote for free. So, nice. okay. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then uh, you would have like four years to figure out what the next one was going to be in to vote on it and yada, 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 yeah. and raise money again for a good cause. Like, I don't see any issue with this. It would definitely uh, limit motherfuckers from running for office, too. Yeah. You know? And the group who was least served and possibly even harmed by that president should be the ones who get to elect a representative to be the assassin. Ooh, nice. nice. Yes, I love that. And if they have a disagreement, then they can put it up to a vote within their own community. Yeah. Here, here's here's another idea. Here's a, I, assassin. Okay. While you were talking, I came up with two other ideas on how to solve the aging problem in politics. Number one, oh, we one hundred, oh. we one hundred percent switch the rules between electing president and the Miss America pageant. Um, so when it comes to like voting on Miss America, it takes like two years. And there are debates, but when it comes to president, okay, it's time for the swimsuit competition. <laughs> okay, okay, uh, uh, Mitt Romney, what's your talent? Nice. nice, Mitt Romney. I got some questions here. If you were a tree, <laughs> what's your favorite day of the year? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I really like that. Oh, what was the other one that I came up with? Ah, oh, I forgot it. Dang it. Uh, Miss America. What was the other one that I came up with while you were talking? Oh, I totally no, forgot. I totally forgot. Look, I think that this is a movement we can all. This is a. I, I really like this and, movement. I mean, it, seriously, think about it. If this was legit, then people who are running for office would think twice oh, about running for office. I remembered. I remembered what I came up with. Instead of having uh, any political candidate spend an ins obscene amount of money and that's one thing that i hate in the news is that they'll literally say oh instead of instead of focusing on people want to vote for this candidate instead of this other candidate a lot of times the media will focus on "Ooh, here's how much money this candidate has and here's how much money this candidate has we pass a new law you want to run for any political office good luck you spend nothing. Oh, zero dollars. Get them. You're not allowed ads. You're not allowed shit. How are you going to run for president now? Genuine homegrown. Yeah. Like genuine 100 percent. Like no one can buy ads. No one can order an ad on the paper. It's just 100 percent like signs on the street corner and like. But you, to knock in yeah. You see uh, you see uh, uh, Ted Cruz doing a, a car wash. <laughs> in the in the church's fried chicken parking lot vote for me you know okay how about this this is so much fun we <laughs> replace the white house floors with pressure sensitive floor floors that are in sync with your polling numbers Ooh. so that if your polling numbers fall too far the fo the floor collapses drops away and drops you into the pit of hungry tigers 
Nice. nice. I like that. Yeah. Can I we like make that. It boars or like pigs, though? Pigs like in uh, like in Hannibal. Yeah. Pigs? There's no I can go with pigs. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Because like if, if it's just a, 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 a pigs like lion, snatch lions don't eat the bones, you know, so yeah. like, somebody's got to go in there and clean that shit up. If Do you, you know pigs, what nemesis means? It's a yeah. self cleaning thing, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, here's it. When when Bunny was talking about pressure sensitive floor, what came into my mind was, oh, yes, we build the danger room. From Professor X's mansion. Nice. And we just put the presidents in there. And it's like, okay, whoever lasts the longest in the danger room, it's set to ludicrous speed. And then whoever survives the longest is our president. Uh, I thought that's where Bunny was going with it. It's not where he went, but no, that's also but another also great that. idea. Well, but then from what Tasha said, bringing up pig, Made me think, like, if you want to be president, we we black mirror this shit. You want to be president? Ooh, okay. You got to fuck this pig first. Wait, well, hold on. I missed, I missed that. It was you missed that. Right. Yeah. What, what, what's that again, Benny? If you want to be president, you've got to fuck this pig first. Why are we doing this? Just because, <laughs> god damn it. We want to make no. sure they want the job. <laughs> he doesn't deserve this. I thought Bunny was going in a Kingsman way, <laughs> where it's like, uh, okay, you want to be a Kingsman, eh? Here's your last test. Here's the cute puppy you've been taking care of. Here Jesus. is a fucking gun. That's where I thought he was going with it. Like, it's like, you want to be president? Okay. Shoot this baby. Lick this <laughs> toilet. We need to see if you really want this. Yes. <laughs> Have sex with this cow. If you can successfully penetrate this bull, <laughs> you can be president. Let's see who can give the biggest specimen. Well, but then we can then we can at least sit back, you know, and and be like, you know. He really sucks on foreign politics, but man, can he fuck a pig. And the other... Freedom would be up your ass. The, the other countries would be like, we need to bomb America. We Maybe we should leave America alone. Crazy motherfucker. Uh, yeah, those weirdos. America giving the rest of the world the crazy uh, ass. We're going to let it be. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> Bit scared. But yeah, I still think... Okay, but I'm still here for this public execution idea. Yeah, public execution or a... Uh, fuck it, let's just let's just Star Trek it. We give two of them both weapons, we put them in an arena. <laughs> we do that. Like in the cable guy. like a question of physical prowess and not necessarily somebody that you're gonna... You don't wanna okay, okay, hold on. What was the name? 10 minute warning. It, what was the name of the obstacle course at the end of American Gladiators? Oh, That's how we figure out the presidency. <gasps> the Eliminator! That's how we do it. Again. We do the Eliminator. Two presidents, and hey, look up there. That's Malibu. <laughs> he's like six foot ten. He's got muscles. I... But he's too stupid to be a wrestler. So now he's going to be shooting foam balls at you. Knock him over with a giant Q-tip. Let's solve it with Japanese game shows. We'll just <laughs> we'll just oil up that ramp. Yeah, we'll just oil up that ramp. There you go. Which, whichever one of you gets up there. We finish it with the wipeout course. Every every election, wipeout course. Whichever president can get past the big balls, boom. I think that's how we should just pick our candidates. Our nomination, our nominees. Ooh, yeah, we pick like yeah. 30 nominees and then there you go. We have a... Yeah, you, yeah, I think that's how we should do our yeah. nominees. Yeah, That's such a great idea. Uh, we are we full of good it. ideas. We Man, I we're the next We're the next political uh, minds. We are. You know? Right. Man. I'm yeah. I'm the next uh, Cargill. I'm the next... Uh, I'm the next Roger Stone... <laughs> Can you repaint what? 
can. Oh, heck yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah, the little boy blue in the back. I bought this. We bought this for what? Like $5? $3? Oh, yeah. $3.99 at a Goodwill. This little fancy lad here. This is more of a visual thing, so you really should watch us when we record on Twitch. You know what I'm thinking? Give him a David Bowie or a, or a Rocky Horror look. You know? But yeah, you can absolutely paint that. That's a great idea. Uh, yeah. So we're going to take a short break because we record this on Zoom. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, you helped. I, I was already done. You helped me get through the oh. length of this. I mean, I could continue because I, continue yeah, if we wanted, but no, we absolutely could. But you no, know, we've got seven and a half minutes before uh, Zoom kicks us off. So we're going to take a short break. When we come back, it's time for Steve's historic approximations. I've we're going to be talking about John Cougar Mellon Camp and a small town in Indiana and obsession. Obsession. Okay. Is that a perfume? No. I already told you this. The guy who with the diary. Oh my god. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. And then after that, we're gonna run out the meter. I've got a lot to talk about. Uh I have a lot going for myself. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I I'm showing off some cleave right now. Really, really? proud of that. Yeah, I'm showing off a bit of cleave. I got my, I got my, I got an all natural pair uh, that I've been growing. <coughs> so, pretty excited about that. Plus, the edible should be kicking in soon. So, that's there you exciting. go. Yeah. So, uh, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, Max, you wanted to do some sort of an, an a transition exit. What was that we were talking before the bath. No. Okay, yes. Come come and do it. I mean, he said, I don't know what it was. Okay. It was Maxwell News. Okay, Maxwell's going to lead us out. This is Maxwell News, and don't you ever dare to snooze. We'll be, we'll be back after this short break with him. Breaking news. We will be right back with more of the Pope on film after this. Do 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 are you scared? I'm, I'm really, really scared. I'm scared. This is my impression of Jigsaw if he was an eight-year-old child. Hello, Mom and Dad. I'd like to play a game. Do you, do you have any games on your phone? That I could play, please. I like the Kitos. 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 I don't remember. Rebels! Rebels! You can't tell me what to do. You're not my dad.
And we're back with more of the Pope on film. Hey! Yes. Sorry, honey. I don't want to yell it in front of the. I know. I know. Into the microphone. That's okay. So just directly at you. Sorry. If you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast, The Pope on Film. I mean, who is it nowadays? It's sweeping the nation. But only real fans, true hardcore fans of this podcast who have been with us since the beginning would know two, two, the two main facts. The two things you need to know, the two major facts, true, 100% true, and not really real truth and not made up on the spot facts about the both of us, Bunny and Mei Lin. The first fact, which is about you, Bunny, is that when you're not doing the podcast, you are, in fact, a celebrated plastic surgeon. So tell us, Bunny, what part of the world of plastic surgery is your speciality? Uh- I specialize more in, you know, I, I, I can't do things like rhinoplasty and just nose reductions yeah. and let's lift your cheek and give you a cute little chin. No, I am an artist. I am an artist who has studied under Pablo Picasso and Plastic surgery is my passion. Just because God put your nose in the middle of your face doesn't mean that that's where it needs to stay. And that's why you chose this week's film. That is correct. Surgery is is the new sex. Everybody knows that. You have a much better scope of vision. If your eyes were where your nipples are. Very true. I have it's always like thought that. Point of gravity. Yeah. With a wide scope. And a lot of peripheral vision. I have always thought that. 100%. I have always thought that. I'm so most, glad that's. Most mouths. Should be completely removed. Finally. You know? Finally, someone is not scared to say the the real stuff. The real truth. And I I am thankful for you, buddy. I am very thankful for you. You can eat rectally, but you haven't had shit to say in years. (laughs) I like that. And the second fact, which is about me, uh, it, it, if if you think that this is a bit strange and awkward, just FYI, the edibles have kicked in. There we go. Which, which I am uh, legally taking. Uh, the judge said it was okay. And the second fact, which is about me, is that I'm a lover of history. I love it, but I'm also a storyteller. So what I like to do at this point is I like to find a story from the history books and sort of reword it via my own unique storytelling razzmatazz, and that's what this is, another educationally uneducational installment of Steve's Historic Approximation! Dun, 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 dun. Or Shap, as I like to call it, repeatedly, annoyingly, whether anybody wants me to or not. Now, personally, I I like the name Shap. It's short. It's plucky. It's fun. It's got moxie. It's like my ex, Debbie, but without the drug dependency and the stinky ferret smell. Anywho. (laughs) That was a deep burn. Ouch. This week on the old Shappity Shap Shap, we will be looking at the life of a high school teacher and minister whose insane fixation definitely puts the OMG in OCD. This guy wrote so frigging much that basically he's the patron saint of writers, the new patron saint of writers, a new saint for a new era. 
So move over, St. Francis de Sales, the Roman Catholic saint of writers and journalists, whose feast day is January 24th. And once again, I'd like to take this time to salute Wikipedia, the official savior of podcasters everywhere. Salute! Uh, today's chap is about a man, the late great Reverend Robert W. Shields, as I, or as I like to think of him, the new and improved patron saint of writers. So this guy, this friggin' guy, yeah. and I put, and I put, to be clear, <laughs> to show you exactly how much I write this out. I wrote Italian hand gestures in parentheses. Hey. This friggin' guy. This gabaragoo. This... So, he was born in 1918 in Seymour, Indiana. A town so small that it's actually smaller than my own small town, so... I'm really sorry and apologize to all the people of Seymour, Indiana. But hey, congrats on being the birthplace of John Cougar Mellencamp. Yes. Who was born in Seymour, Indiana. Ooh, we're the birthplace of John Cougar Mellencamp. Wow, check out the big dick on Seymour, Indiana. <laughs> Apparently, that's where Jack and Diane are from. Two American kids growing up in the heartland of Seymour, Indiana. So good why, on you, Seymour. It's, it's, since we're there for a moment, why yes. did it take so many decades and decades for people to realize that sucking on a chili dog was a stupid fucking line? Sucking on a chili dog behind the taste of freeze. The thing is, is that he just wanted the chili. He didn't want the dog. So no. he would just put the entire hot dog in his mouth, suck all the chili off of it, and then just throw the hot dog in the trash. Yeah. That's how people eat in Seymour, Indiana. We know that now. So, um, hey, good on you, Seymour, Indiana. Man, no one famous was born in my small town in Oklahoma. Except for the celebrated astronaut Gordon Cooper. And John, the... Uh, John and the in Cougar Mellencamp has always seemed to me somebody who was celebrated... Far more than his music deserved. <laughs> well, I swear to you, Bunny. This is the year 2022. We should rightly be saying, John, who? Who is this person that Malin is talking about? Who is this John yeah. Cougar We're really that, that she is We're referencing? I don't know who he is. That's how history really should great... have gone. Man, this is why we're so popular with the young people. We're always saying such uh, timely young references like John Cougar Mellencamp. Yes. He doesn't he doesn't go by the Cougar anymore. No, fuck him. He dropped the Cougar. You can't put in a Cougar and then take it back out again, bitch. I 100% You're John Cougar Melon Camp. I'll let I you believe have the I Melon mentioned... Camp begrudgingly. I, I, I believe I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but this blows my mind. Sometime last decade, sometime between uh, 2010 and 2020, Stephen King wrote a musical with T-Bone Burnett and John Cougar Mellencamp. He wrote a horror musical called The Ghost Brothers of Dark Darkland, Darkhold, Darkland County. And some of the music is great. And he he wrote this 
play, and he got T-Bone Burnett and John Cougar Mellencamp to write spooky music to go with it. And he he traveled around America with a cast. They made a uh, a like a like a full cast a recording of it on CD, and it features some famous names. Like the Devil is played by Elvis Costello. One of the brothers is played by. All right, all right, all right. And it's surprising that Stephen King wrote a musical that no one has effing heard of. Yeah. But it's good. It's pretty good. Where have you seen or heard this? We got the official uh, the official book in at the bookstore when I worked at the bookstore and it came with the CD of music. And I'm like, wait, Stephen King wrote a musical? Why is this the first time I've heard about it? And I looked it up and yeah, it was uh it it was supposedly like a really great musical and they toured it across America and the hope was that eventually it would, you know, maybe make it to Broadway, but it never did. And so they stopped touring with the musical, but Stephen King wrote a musical with John Cougar Mellencamp and T-Bone Burnett. There's a song called Tear This Cabin Down. It is effing beautiful. I yeah. freaking love that song, and I listen to it all the time. And it's from that musical. Yeah, it's weird. So, uh, oh, yes. What were we talking about? What was the place I lost? Seymour, Indiana. Yes. That's where the Reverend Robert W. Shields was born. It's also the birthplace of John Cougar Mellencamp. And I was talking about how my small town in Oklahoma has no one famous that was born here. Except for um, celebrated astronaut Gordon Cooper and the indie band Shiny Toy Guns. Oh, and also this actor. You probably have never heard of him. Brad Pitt. Yeah. But hey, it's not a contest. Not a contest. So, Bunny, uh, this is where I went down a pretty steep rabbit hole. So I was born in a small town in Arizona. And the only real famous person born there. MILF porn actress Holly Sampson. Okay. I can't, I was born in the same small town as MILF porn actress Holly Sampson. And I said, Holly Sampson, I don't know who that is. There are some porn actresses from <coughs> in in my path that I could tell you. I could tell you about Stormy Daniels. I could ter- tell you about Sarah J. But I was trying to think of like Holly Sampson. That's a name that rings a bell. How do I know the name Holly Sampson? Well, apparently she was one of several women linked to the numerous infidelities of Mr. Tiger Woods. Okay. And 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 I Wikipedia is great, but it can also be a drug. So, I'm trying to write about the Reverend Robert W. Shields, then suddenly I'm learning about the small town of Seymour, Indiana. And suddenly I'm learning about Tiger Woods' numerous infidelities. And it's like, oh yeah, that's why we hate him now. Tiger Woods was everywhere, and then suddenly he got a DUI and he started banging a bunch of chicks and we stopped. We, like, shut him down in society. Of course we shut him down. Because how they're a non-white person. Yes. Yes. I believe that if he was white, he would have been forgiven. Absolutely. If if Mel Gibson is still allowed to make movies, yeah. I mean, also, Dang. That, like he was the media darling, you know, the young, yeah. young up and coming, blah blah blah. Oh my God, did you see this person of color, this media sensation? Yeah. And then it, yeah, fizzled out because they were like, "Oh, he's a cheater." Shut yeah, down, y'all. Shut it down. Yeah, so so Holly Sampson was a porn actress, and and suddenly everyone's talking about uh, uh Tiger Woods and all the chicks he was banging, and Holly Sampson just came out and said, "Oh yeah, I was one of them. Oh yeah, had sex with Tiger Woods. Had sex with Tiger Woods at a, a party on the bathroom. Yeah, I've had sex with him." <laughs> and then, but then, like a couple of months later, she said. Oh, wait, I thought that saying that I had sex with Tiger Woods would be a popular thing. People hate me now. Um, 
I didn't do it. I lied. But we know you bang Tiger Woods. <laughs> bang Tiger Woods, Holly Sampson. Anyway, I digress. Reverend Robert Shields, born in Seymour, Indiana in 1918. That name he is sat- familiar. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it will be. He sadly passed away on October 15th, 2007. And upon his death, his diaries were donated to Washington State University. And under the terms of said donation, the diary may not be read or, quote, subjected to a word count for 50 years from his death. So basically, Reverend Robert Shields' diary will be open to the public on October 15th, 2057. So mark your calendars, people! Oh shit, can you believe it? I already have two things scheduled that day. <laughs> Isn't that always the case? That's oh, that's always Murphy's Law. Around here, it's it's laundry day, so, you know. Laundry day? <laughs> oh no, that was garbage day. Garbage day? <laughs> uh, I can shuffle things around so I can so I can be there for the diary opening. I'll shuffle things around. Anywho, I digress. At this juncture, you might be thinking to yourself, self, why the word count stipulation there? The word count stippy? Why the stippy, yo? That's probably what you're thinking, Bunny. I, you've got a look that says, why the stippy, yo? Yes. You've always had that sort of, well, let me tell you. Well, let me tell you something, brother. Reverend Shields' diary consists of well over 37 million words. Okay. And his full diary fills 91 boxes. Why 91 boxes? Because this certified mad lad successfully chronicled every five minutes of his life from 12 a.m. to 12 p.m. every day from 1972 until 1997. Every five minutes of his life was chronicled in his diaries. Bunny, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Robert 155. I really have to pee. <laughs> you have no idea, Bonnie, how right you are. Robert Shields had a diary where he chronicled every five minutes of his life for 25 years. According to NPR, who managed to interview him before his death, his office had six, count them, six IBM typewriters in case the other fives broke. And he would sleep for no more than two hours at a time so that he could wake up and chronicle each dream individually. He also left nose hair samples in his diary, quote, for DNA purposes, you know, because in the future, uh, surgery is the new sex. So uh, Bob Shields, nothing if not thorough. I also just like, Another thing, besides the fact that he was certifiably insane and chronicled every five minutes of his life for 25 years, I like it when you see a name and it sounds like a Ford dealership. Yes. Come on down to Bob Shields Ford this Friday and Saturday. Free hot dogs for the kids. So he would oftentimes record his body temperature and his blood pressure And, of course, he recorded every bowel movement and every pee for 25 years. And so I'm looking into this crazy, this crazy ass dude, trying to learn more about him. What makes him tick? The Reverend Shields. And uh, here was the stunning part. Really stunned. Really stunned. He was married and had three kids. 
And is that in his diary? No offense to the dead. However, how do you manage to be a good father and an e- at least semi decent husband when you're writing a 37.5 million word chronicle of every five minutes of your life for 25 years? I'm just saying. I don't think he was the most caring, attentive husband. I don't think he was probably the world's best dad. 12.35. Lisa let out a moan. I may have found the clitoris. <laughs> he wrote so intensely because he believed that if he stopped, it would be, quote, like turning off my life. And again, uh, call me crazy. Crazy. Thank you. But first, doesn't this sound like a Will Ferrell movie waiting to happen? Yes, it does. Can't you see it? Because I can. I can 100% see uh, not Jim Carrey. Will Ferrell. I can 100% see Will Ferrell starring in the uh, in the Reverend Shields movie. So, uh, as per the as per the stippy, people aren't allowed to read it right now. However, passages have been leaked. Okay, and I have some here for you, Bunny. These are legitimate breakdowns of Robert Shields' diary. He chronicled literally every five minutes of his life for 25 years. He would start at 12 a.m. sleeping. 12.05, sleeping. 12.10, farted, sleeping. You know, so here are some breakdowns of his life. July 25th, 1993, 7 a.m. I cleaned out the tub and scraped my feet with my fingernails to remove layers of dead skin. Yes. 7.05 a.m. Passed a large, firm stool and a pint of urine. Used five sheets of paper. (laughs) And again, these are real passages. I'm not uh, taking the piss. These are real, actual passages of his diary. April 18th, 1994, 6.30 to 6.35. I put in the oven two Stouffer's macaroni and cheese at 350 degrees. (laughs) 6.35 to 6.50. I was at the keyboard of the IBM wheel writer making entries for this diary. 6.50 6.50 to 7.30, I ate the Stouffer's macaroni and cheese, and Cornelia ate the other one. I'm assuming that's the name of the wife. Grace decided she didn't want one. 7.30 to 7.35, we changed the light over the back stoop since the bulb had burned out. Thank God you gave this to the university. They're really going to love it. Yes. Uh, April 30th, 1994, 11 to 11.30, I picked over parts of Newsweek and Time and Harvard Magazine and reread them while I ate about a dozen uh, about a dozen leftover fish sticks cold. Oh. August 21st, 1994, 2.25 to 2.35, I checked on whether our country tax County tax payment had been received. It had. So these are the diaries of uh, Robert Shields. Uh, Thank God he donated them to science because uh, I think scientists are really going to get a lot out of this. Yes. Uh, He continued to chronicle his life in five minute increments until he had a. Oh, my goodness. Can someone help me with dogs? 
someone in the house. Did I get help? Maybe close the door or something. Okay, thank you. Uh, freaking dogs. He continued to chronicle his life in five-minute increments until he had a stroke that left him disabled in 1997. Now, I'm really sorry about this next part because I think it's kind of funny. Okay. Um, because he just had a stroke and he's disabled now. I shouldn't find this funny, but I do. So Bob is all, oh, Grace is the name of the wife. Grace is the name of the wife. So uh, Reverend Shields. So then who the hell is Cornelia? Maybe that's their kid, because they did have three kids. But, okay, so Reverend Shields is like, Grace, my beloved wife, I have had a stroke and can no longer continue my diary. So you must take up my cause. You, my beloved wife, must write my life and continue with my life's work. Go now, beloved wife. Go to my IBM typewriter and chronicle. Continue to chronicle my days in five-minute increments. Continue my work so that I may live on. Let us start now. Write this down. 835. Scratch my nutsack. And the wife is all like, Okay. Yay. No. <laughs> no. So she tried doing it for a while and then gave up. <laughs> so it, uh, that's the story of Reverend Bob Shields, the new patron saint of writers. Oh, this okay. is a one hundred percent true story, and I freaking love it. I think it's wonderful. I it, it and it's funny because sometimes I will want to write something. I have an idea for a book, and I want to write it, but it's like, oh, I don't really have any time. And it's like, hey, if you if you are thinking that, if you're like, oh, I need to sit down in front of the computer, I need to sit and write this. Think of Robert Shields, okay? Yes. If Robert Shields can fin can fill 91 boxes with his diary, you probably have a novel in you. <laughs> yeah. You've got the time. So I really do think <sighs> that uh I really do think that uh move over St. Francis de Sales, the Roman Catholic saint of writers and journalists. Now we've got Bobby Shields. Yes, we do. And I looked him up because his name sounds familiar, so I thought I might have seen him somewhere or something like that. But everything he comes up with is Robert Shields, wordy diarist. Mm-hmm. That's him. Meticulous diarist. Yeah, I didn't know diarist was a thing until I, lo I, until I um, looked into this chap. Detailed diarist. Diarist. Yeah. That's a new word for me. That was 100% new. Yeah. So, so in this particular case, Jesus really took a backseat to the diary, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he used to be a reverend. Now he just diarists. Yeah. Hey, rib music. I remember rib music. Rib, rib music. music. Just passed above our heads. That was a good chef. Um, speaking of chefs, what do you think about the trailer for the Great Emu War? Yes, that was great. That was a good chef. Yes, it was. Really nice to see a good-looking trailer for a chef. Okay, ten minute so warning. That's, so that's it for Steve's historic approximations this week. Next week, we're going to be talking about a movie franchise and its. Troubles with censorship. I'm really excited. This we're going to talk about the and the problem it has had with the Motion Picture Association of America. So join us next week for more educational, educational fun with Steve. <laughs>
Welcome to Historic Approximation! A cut on... Money! Yes. I got nine minutes. That's enough time. It's time. We're, we're running out the meter now. Money, are you there? Yes, we seem to be lagging. Yeah, okay. I don't know what that is, but... Well, I mean, I know it, but... I swear it's not me. So, you still hear me? I can still hear you, yeah. Okay. Good, good, good. Okay. Uh, so, I wanted to talk a little about my... Um... Take the next hour and talk about me. I've had a bit of a rough year. Uh, I don't want to get into it. For a while. Uh, so right, no we're, we're locked but... up. We're completely locked up. Are? Yeah. What the heck? Recording audio, at least, right? Well, I just stopped recording and I'm restarting it because it's completely frozen on Twitch. Oh, okay. Weird. Oh, yeah, I see that. Okay. Are we back on now? I think we might be okay now. Okay. Cool. Now I have seven minutes. Okay, I can still do this. Okay, okay so so we're back. Okay. I've had a bit of a rough year. I don't want to get into it for a while. But I've had a pretty rough year. No details, but Bunny knows, Jeannie knows. Uh, sometimes I think about the hardships that I have suffered this year in the year of our Lord 2022. And I get down about it. And I get down about myself and I think that like I'm I'm not doing anything with my life. Uh, I have nothing going on. And what I do in those times is I try and write out exactly what I have done this year and what I've accomplished and the changes that have come about in my life. Number one, I am transitioning. I am officially transitioning. Tomorrow will be my 18th week on. Uh, HRT, hormone replacement therapy. Wow, I'm, I, I, I'm having a hard time believing that it's been that yeah. long. Eighteen weeks, and uh, it it was so easy to to get into it too. It, with with Mao, my son, we because he is so young, we had to jump through all of these hoops and fill out all these forms, and they had to go to all of these different meetings and stuff like that and it was really difficult but for me i had i i i got a i i got an appointment with a gender clinic in the city and i met with them for an hour i left with a prescription for my medication it was so quick and easy and it's been 18 weeks and there's a lot of changes happening to me i actually have a pair yeah. of uh, boobages now and i'm really proud of that uh, my moods are suddenly in HD. And he wants to see them. Little. Uh, I don't know. That I was looking at you. Yeah. Uh, I got a little bit. It's difficult on Twitch because I've got a very, a very small uh, window. But I'll, I'll send you a little picture, Genie. How about that? <laughs> okay. I'll send you a little something. I'll send you a little something, something. My moods are suddenly in HD. It's like before I started my uh, transitioning, I had my moods were in 480p uh, with only primary colors. It's the difference between watching Walt Disney's The Wonderful World of Color and watching a super high definition episode of Lost. Suddenly, oh, my moods. Okay. Suddenly, my moods are in like twenty one eighty p with every color of the rainbow, and and it, my emotions are completely different now. I was in a race this month. I came in eleventh place. Yes, I'm. Um, I'm. I'm trying. I'm setting up right now. Hopefully, to do another race in March. This time with Natasha. I have an audition next month for a play here in town. And what's the play? 
It's called Puffs. Seven years in the life of a certain school for wizards and wizards. Okay. It's, it's a Harry Potter parody about the most unpopular group of uh, people in the school. And I think I think I'm a shoe in. Uh, I I have recently downloaded a uh, filmed version of the play, and it's so freaking hilarious, and I love it. And there's one guy and one girl who are usually cast to be all the teachers, but I think I think uh, I'm a two for one package. I could play all the guy and girl teachers. Yeah, no problem. So I I I, I picked out a monologue. I'm memorizing it right now. Uh, I haven't missed a single mass since March. I signed up to be a reader. I took a class. So one of these Sundays, I'll be reading at mass. Uh, my wife and I are doing great. We love each other. We go out on dates every once in a while. I got a vasectomy consultation. Okay. And I'm really excited about that. Because uh, uh, if, if, if women can't get uh, abortions, why is it always on the women to have to get an abortion men it, it, i'm a woman but you know i i got equipment and let me tell you it works just fine <laughs> no out of order sign on this arcade machine so uh, i'm getting a uh vasectomy i'm looking into ffs hopefully it's not something official but i i'm thinking about maybe getting a facial feminization surgery a oh, lot okay. of a lot of insurances cover that as a part of transitioning and if i can get it covered shit they can uh they can uh you know shave down my adam's apple fix my hairline a little bit i got a bit of a widow's peak uh feminize my nose get my chin and my jawline a little bit changed make me look more feminine I don't think I don't need it because already I'm looking pretty fabulous. I think, but uh, I'm looking into it. And also another thing that uh, I have going for me, I think the podcast has been effing great. This has been fun. This has just been fun to do. And even if it's a horrible movie, ah, oh, it's still just a blast. Yeah. No, we haven't done the movie yet. And Natasha saw some of the movie with me. There are some times when we watch a movie for the podcast, and the first thing I think of is, oh, poor fucking genie. <laughs> fucking, you mean to tell me you sat there with her and you watched this week's movie? What the fuck? I watched this by myself. I fell asleep on the first <laughs> one. That's a oh, great God. review. Good job. Yeah, so we're going to be taking a break. Less than a minute left before Zoom kicks us out. We're going to be taking a little halftime. And be sure and stay with us, because when we come back, we're talking about the 2022 uh, Aragon Kristen Stewart film. Crimes of the Future Not Related. Yes. Aragon and Bella Swan. That they're an indie band. I saw them in '98 <laughs> in Tempe. They were amazing. They played mostly stuff off their first album. I loved them. I saw them once open up for Tegan and Sarah. Aragon and Bella Swan opened up for Tegan and Sarah. Tegan and Sarah. Yeah. So we'll be right back with more of the Pope on Film after these messages. Do 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 do.
Hello, everybody. It's me, Mr. Steve. Well, it's Thursday. How's your Thursday doing? It's totally Thursday and not Saturday after my Raising Little Leader story time and I'm going through a story time marathon to make my week easier. Look, I'm in a different outfit. Anyway, today's video is a strange one. If you are familiar with this channel, you know I make a lot of references to pop culture and I use a lot of little clips here and there. And so this is a short compilation of some of my favorite clips that I use during story time videos. Some of them you may have seen before in other videos. Some of them you may have seen a bunch of times in other videos. But it's a fun little video that you'd enjoy. Woo! I'm Michael Jordan. Stop it. Get some help. Life, uh, finds a way. Imagination. Not funny! Thank you for being a friend. Travel down the road and back again. Mr. Steve is recording this theme song so he doesn't get a copyright strike. And if you throw a party, invited everyone you knew. Oh, wow. You would see the biggest gift would be for me. And the card attached would say, be sure to like and subscribe. Hi, it's Vince with Sham Wow. You'll be saying wow every time you use this towel. Vicky Guerrero! Excuse me! Vicky! Everybody dance. This is called foreshadowing. Foreshadowing happens when clues in a story hint at future events. Roll the cheese! Advising lawmakers, I can see he had. I just got a dog. Would you like to see my dog? Come here, Fido Spot! Bark, bark, woof! I am dog! Bring me bone! Only bone shall sustain me! I am Sam I am. I am Sam I am. Would you like green eggs and ham? Would you like them over there? Or would you like them over here? Would you eat them in a box? Would you eat them with a fox? Would you like them in a house? Would you like them with a mouse? You may like them, you will see. You may like them in a tree. Would you could you with a goat? Would you could you in a boat? 
I could not like them. Those green eggs and ham. I cannot stand them. Mr. Sam, I am. Would you, could you in a car? Eat them, eat them, here they are. How about in the rain, in the dark, or on a train? are falling on my head Just like the guy whose feet are too big for his bed Nothing seems to fit Those raindrops are falling on my head They keep falling so I just did some talking to the sun. I said I didn't like the way he got things done. Sleeping on the job. Those raindrops are falling on my head. They keep falling. There's one thing I know The blues they sent to me Won't defeat me It won't be long Till happiness steps up to greet me When the rocks are falling on my head That doesn't mean my eyes will soon be turning red. Clients not for me because I'm never gonna stop the rain by complaining. Because I'm free. I say it's the moon. I know it's the sun. Now, by my mother's son, that's myself. It shall be moon or star or anything I list. Ere we journey back to your father's. Go on, get the horse. There's seriously something wrong. Beautiful music in movies, on radio and TV. 
he's sold over 20 million records around the world. His name is Zom Fear. Master of the pan flute, that magical instrument with the unforgettable sound. Now in his magnificent all-new collection, Zom Fear plays the world's most beautiful melodies. and save COD charges by calling toll-free 1-800-421-2000. Or, to save all additional charges, send check or money order for only $12.98 for two albums or two cassettes, or $19.98 for two compact discs to Zomphir, P.O. Box 8449, Atlanta, Georgia. Remember, that's Zomphir, P.O. Box 8449, Atlanta, Georgia. Live fast, die young, leave a good-looking corpse. You just make sure you come back next week. It is time to stop seeing. It is time to listen. A new world opens up. You afraid of a little emotion? Let's retrace the news sex. They are evolving away from the human path. It could be a revelation. And we're back with more of the Pope on Film. It's time, Bunny! It's time. Uh, yes, Bunny, my friend, who is more than brother to me. I embrace thee. You're my brother, Bunny. Uh, not by blood. You're my brother by film. And yes. film is stronger than blood. You don't do an hours long, hours long podcast for eight years without really getting to know a person. And I just want to say that I uh, love you and I uh, appreciate you, Bunny. You're awesome. Thank you. Anywho, I digress. That's going to be my new catchphrase because I digress a lot. Anywho, I digress. It is time 
once again for all of us here at the Pope Fun Film Podcast to hot stepper our way into the second half of our big shoe. And it is said second half, wherein we finally and eventually get around to discussing our all new no drip maximum strength 12 hour relief. Do not use if printed neck band is broken or missing. Movie of the week. And this week, we continue our celebration of Buntober, Bunny's birth month, by giving him the reins of the podcast for a few weeks. And uh, my wife, my amazing wife, Natasha, uh, stood next to me and watched a bit of the movie. And she's like, the fuck is this? And I'm like, it's what happens in October. (laughs) What happens in October is Yahtzee. We're going to roll the dice and whatever happens, happens. So this episode, we get our Cronenberg on with our most Cronenberg film to date. The notorious 2022 David Cronenberg sci-fi body horror art house sci-fi mess. Crimes of the future. And first off, Bunny, uh, big news in the world of of Hollywood. Oh, look at this. I got a I got a bulletin. You're not going to believe it. Martin Scorsese's next film is going to be called Goodfellas. Ah. But it's going to star Dane Cook Hmm? and Christina Applegate. And it'll be about a baby duck who gets his head stuck in a stewed tomato. Okay. So that's exciting. Goodfellas. Yes. Uh, Steven Spielberg just announced that his next film is is called THX 1138 but it's actually it's actually about Crimea. It's about the Crimean War and the invention of post-it notes. Really really strange. Fucking it really pisses me off that this effing movie is called Crimes of the Future. That really upsets me. It upsets me. That it's like, I'm going to use this movie again. And then you hear like reviewers, oh, who are creaming in their jeans over this movie. You see all these critics be like, oh, obviously, although not the although these films are not related, they obviously share many of the same sensibilities and might even take part in the same universe. I, don't make excuses. Yeah. You are Cronenberg. so stretching. Yeah. I saw a review because... How can uh, they exist I, in the same universe when there are women in one and no women in the other? I just think that David Cronenberg is one of those people now that just uh, reviewers will cream over. Period. Yes. Doesn't matter what he did. That poster, I'm staring at that poster right now. Yeah. He's got resting Woody Harrelson face, and I've never noticed it before. <laughs> but he has really got resting Woody. If he s- smiled just now and you saw some really bad teeth, I'd be, holy shit. Are you going to train me to be in the Hunger Games? Are you going to go work at Cheers? <laughs> uh, critics will just love, I think, any David Cronenberg movie. I saw some review. I saw some review. I read a lot of reviews. I saw a review that said, Kristen Stewart adding some much needed levity as the comedy relief of the film. What film were you watching? Yeah. Because you were not watching Crimes of the Future. I I was interested in her quirky performance, but I didn't find comedy. Maybe you got confused and you thought that the new Charlie's Angels reboot was uh, David Cronenberg's Charlie's Angels, but no, because she was very funny as the comedy relief in in that film. Uh, I watched that in February. (laughs) Yeah. 
I, I watched that just in time for Women's History Month. Great movie for Women's History Month. You know, you go girls. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it, again, that that's stretching. I, the Rotten Tomatoes says it best. The critic score for Crimes of the Future is 80%. The audience score, fifty percent. Yeah, that says so much about the state of movie reviewing that critics are tripping over themselves to like fillet David Cronenberg. But normal people, I feel a lot of people, like there's a freaking pandemic. It's still happening, despite what our elderly president says. It's still happening. And people are still dying. And just because you're not reporting on the deaths that are happening doesn't mean that the deaths aren't happening. People are still dying from this pandemic. And now we've got this monkeypox thing going on. And why is every other article about the monkeypox just a close up picture that makes me want to vomit? Use a different picture. <laughs> Sick of seeing monkeypox photos. So, so. You know what I don't want to see? Depressing body horror. <laughs> Call me crazy. I want to be entertained. So I didn't like this film. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 when we were uh, messaging about it, it, it just came to me freely. I hadn't written it down on my notes or anything. But, uh, yeah, I would much rather watch 1970s uh, college student foot fetish, the narrated silent film, yeah. again, than have to try and make sense of whatever this is. Because I'll tell you one thing. This movie sounds great. On paper, the plot's amazing. <laughs> theoretically this is a good movie because on paper oh man it's the future and people aren't feeling pain anymore and people are evolving and now they can grow new organs and some people use that as art and get them uh, surgically removed and it's like science and surgery is the new sex and uh, oh but there are some people who are trying to you know uh, the brotherhood of evil mutants is there eating plastic yeah and it's like, okay, this is interesting. This is a this is good. But then you watch the film, and it's like, oh, okay, this 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 is a great movie to read about. But I, I just did not care for it at all, and yeah. it made me appreciate last week more because at least last week was just so bizarre that it's like, ooh, this is interesting. It got to the point where I was hoping for body horror just to sort of like wake me up. <laughs> you know, and it's like, oh, fucking one person speaking in an accent, another person speaking in a completely different accent. Oh, look, here's a ninth accent, and here's another drab room we're in. Can we start cutting someone up? I'm getting real bored over here. <laughs> and then, oh, look at that. We're playing with Aragon's uh, intestines. Okay, well, at least I'm paying attention. Yes. But it, like I, I, I just didn't care at all. This is the latest film. This came out this year. This is new. Yes. Latest film from Davy and Goliath Cronenberg. Fun fact about David Cronenberg: he invented Rick Rolling. He was the first person to say, "Here is a preview for my new movie. I think you'll like it." Let me press play. We're no strangers to love. Yes, I just invented this. It's called Rick Rolling. I don't know what Cronenberg sounds like, but I'm <laughs> assuming he has sort of like a snooty art accent of, yes, well, theoretically, my films have always been about man's grasping of its own consciousness. That's how I assume he sounds. Um. I I found it interesting. I found I found a lot of the ideas being explored to be interesting. We 
there is no good logical way for us to get there. Yeah. But I, I kind of I I was kind of interested seeing this strange different world. Not based in reality at all. And it's like, hey, it's set in the future. You know why? Because they keep telling us and not showing us. Yeah. The entire film looks like it was filmed at Zion right after the orgy. <laughs> and it's like, we're in Zion, the last <laughs> place of actual humans. Now let's start fucking. And then once they're done, it's like, okay, let's go back to our caves and go to sleep. Maybe have some more sex. Oh, don't bother to clean up. David Cronenberg's going to come in here and just film. Yeah. And that's where the setting of this was. The, this movie was set in the set, second Matrix movie. And it was just like, I, I, I will agree with you that I like the concept and the world building. I was interested in that. I was interested in the mythology that they were building and yeah. the future. And I, 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 I thought all of that was fascinating, but the way that they, they had good ideas and they should put it on screen in the most boring way imaginable. That I just mm. could not care about at all. Yeah, no, I, I, I yeah, I, it was kind of twisted and I liked it for its twistedness. <coughs> Vigo Mortensen was definitely doing like a like a Phantom of the Opera kind of a thing going on there. I I thought that it, in my mind I tried to make the movie more exciting and and the way that I did that was he's dressing like Dark Man and talking like Batman. Yeah. So it's like a Dark Man Batman hybrid. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. You can't just say people are growing their own organs and go, uh, evolution. Yeah, evolution doesn't yeah. work like that. Yeah. It did in that. Certainly did in that, but that's not real. Yeah, this is this is how I saw the film. It felt like Davy Cronenberg was just trying real hard to be Cronenbergian. Yeah. I, three minutes into this film, you get a half-naked boy eating a trash can on a dirty bathroom floor. And a minute later, his mom kills him. We get it. You're shocking. Yeah. Ooh, you can dial it back. We're already watching the film. I, I, at, at one point, Cronenberg just became like a verb. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I, I imagine that's got to be pressure. Like, like, like literally... Cronenberg is a way to describe things in Rick and Morty. Yes. Hey, Cronenberg Morty. It's me, Cronenberg Rick. And so his name well, is it's just like, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like household Tarantino in the feet. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's, it's like, like oh, okay, I got this, this, I got this rep for, for having feet in my movie. Now I got to put in a whole lot more feet. Yeah, I felt like th like that's exactly what Cronenberg was doing here. And it's like, oh, shit. I felt like this is a cinematic version of that old Onion article. Marilyn Manson now going door to door to try and shock people. Yes. Yes. And it's like, yeah, that's this film. And Cronenberg is like, yeah, I'm the body horror guy. So how can I make this more squishy? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's how I felt that this was. Uh, so in the film, so this film is set in the future. And in the future, people don't really f experience physical pain anymore. And it, I, I looked into it. I did a lot of reading to figure out why it was that people didn't feel pain anymore. And it's there's a whole backstory to it, which is fascinating. So let me let me explain it to you, Bunny. This is how. See. Zydrate comes in a little glass vial. Ah. And the little glass vial goes into the gun like a battery. Yeah. And the like Zydrate gun. Yeah. And the Zydrate gun goes somewhere against your anatomy. And when the gun goes off, it sparks and you're ready for surgery. Surgery. Yes. So 
and honestly, this is weird, but uh, in 1995, 94, I think it was 95, uh, David Bowie released a concept album which he wanted to be one part of a cycle. He wanted to do like this massive series of concept albums. And he released one in 1995 and he toured with it. And I saw him on tour. He toured with Nine Inch Nails and he played mostly new stuff and not a lot of his old stuff. And people got really pissed off and uh, the album didn't sell well. So he never finished his series. But he did release one concept album in 1995. The concept album was uh, called, it, it was called Outside. And basically, here's the plot of the album. There are art crimes. And so there, there's murder where you're killing someone. And then there's mutilation for the sake of public consumption. Okay. And David Bowie plays Nathan Adler, who is an art crime detective. And he is the one who gets to decide, was this a crime or was this beautiful art? Okay. And uh, he's investigating a 14-year-old who was murdered. And uh, the the lead single from the album was the, the Heart's Filthy Lesson. That was a song of his. It was used in the movie uh, Seven. And... It's from his character's point of view as he is going to the scene of a of a murder to decide whether or not it's art or not. And I I felt like a a bit of Crimes of the Future ripped a, a little bit off of David Bowie is all I'm saying. I I felt like someone got really high and listened to that David Bowie album and said what if we make this better? And it, it, it's a really good uh, concept album, and I really like it. But okay, so Bonnie, um, I feel really bad for saying this. Is there any way that you can explain the plot of this movie? Not in full, because again, there are those, there are just gaping holes. Yeah, in the plot to get to the idea, but apparently they can't feel pain anymore, uh, and some people, I guess, can grow their own organs. Yeah. And they were performance artists. Yes. At least Vigo Mortensen and his partner side piece yeah i mean i didn't get like they really had any kind of relationship outside of the performance art i felt that they had a relationship in the sense that surgery is the new sex so they were kind of doing it yeah even though they never really did it yeah they were doing it because this is the guy who made crash yeah Um, I love James Spader. There, I said it. Freaking love that man. <laughs> but I, but not enough that I'll actually watch The Blacklist. Okay. Or the last season of The Office. Ugh. That was horrible. I'll never watch that again. <laughs> uh, so, um, Vico Mortensen grows his own organs like you do new organs which you then can go get registered at the organ registry place the organ dmv yeah basically and then they would tattoo the organ kind of registering it which is a whole idea and concept, again, which is, like, interesting, but it doesn't go anywhere. 
Nope. Not you know? at all. It does at the end because they're like, we're going to autopsy a boy and wait. All of the boy is tattooed. Yeah. And I was trying to explain it to my wife, but it's like there's no way to explain the plot of this film without sounding like a complete crazy person. But if he, but if he, okay, well, we're kind of getting ahead of this. So that's yeah. basically the plot. He grows new organs, and then they do a performance art piece where they do a live operation and remove the organ, and there's an audience kind of. Yeah. It's an audience almost in a in a peep show kind of way. Yeah. You know, it's it's like not a lot of people and it's got a very just grimy feel about it. Yeah, like eight millimeter. Yeah, like while they're taking pictures with their camera with their phones and shit like that of the surgery and ooh, here's an organ we've never seen any before. Brilliant, bravo, bravo. Yeah, and it's like everyone knows him. Everyone loves him because he's such a major uh, famous body surgery artist. But then when you see him do one of his performances, and there's like 20 people here. Yeah. Like, how are you famous if no one's coming to your... I had story times at the bookstore that had more people than your... Live sex surgery. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, so I don't know how he's supposed to be famous. And and that's about the plot. There's a guy eating chocolate bars, or at least what looks like chocolate bars. Uh, somebody else steals it and grabs a bite and dies. Uh... Turns out he's that kid. He's the plastic eating kid's father, yeah. and now it it's by the mother. now it's all about how we have to evolve to catch up to our technological selves, so that but... we would we would eat the byproducts of our technologies, such as plastics. So there's like a a group of people who are trying to evolve to eat plastic and for whatever reason the government hates that and oh if you can eat plastic you're not a human. And it's like wait a second. So the people who can magically create new organs are humans, but the people who eat plastic are evil freaks? <laughs> That's like the pot calling the kettle a pot. Yes. Yes. So this guy talks to Vigo Mortensen oh, yeah. about doing a performance piece which would be an autopsy on his son that his mother smothered to death with a pillow after reading a plastic bucket. Yeah, and and if I if I got this right. But but stop here a the... second. No, stop here a second. If not for this movie, I would never, ever have uttered a line like that in my life. And True. I think I'm better for it. True. Uh, so I think you. St I still think you're being too harsh on this movie. It's it's a it's a great idea. It's a great concept. It's just freaking boring as hell. Okay, so here are some of the problems that I have with this film. Uh, I don't know what this movie was or what it was trying to say. Aragon whispers the entire movie. He didn't yeah. speak in a normal volume throughout the entire film, so I only understood about 50% of what he said. It's hard to understand the dialogue. Everyone has a different accent, and the settings, it looks like Zion right after the sweaty dance orgy. And it... It's... A few shocking parts of, like, uh, a guy who's all ears 
and uh, live organ transplants. Yes. But in between that are a bunch of people saying things I can barely understand. Yes. And like, I just don't care. Well, again, like Kristen Stewart, I, I, I was really kind of appreciating her performance, but I never understood a fucking thing she was saying. Mm-hmm. I can't, I, I can't even understand the Americans in this film. Yeah. Let alone all of the freaking... I, I, I just had the, the hardest time with this, but I will say, okay, just the general idea and plot and art surgeries and growing limbs and a group of radical evolutionists who are trying to eat plastic and they have a dead body they're going to autopsy. Okay, yeah, all of that sounds great. It didn't look great. Because it was just, it was just boring as hell, and I didn't like it. Yeah. I, I don't have time for pretentious crap about futuristic surgical sex and plastic eating. And is all that surgery like covered under their health insurance? Great question. Great question. I mean, that's not even mentioned. Or can they just afford it because they're rich artists? The see, the thing is, is that if you replace the surgery with anything else. It, like, like, uh, oh, in, in the future, people will get sexual gratification from rubbing potatoes together. I have no idea where I was going. I am pretty high right now. I don't know, but I am interested. Just be I am honest. interested in that. Now just picture that. Picture people rubbing potatoes together. Yeah. That that feels more like the nineteen seventies crimes of the future. As if this was was the most orgasmic experience they've yeah. ever had yeah. in their life. So I feel that this movie was just shocking for shocking's sake. And I would imagine that some potatoes would be hotter than, like, you know, like, fuck Idaho, you know? Right. It's Maine, bitch. You know? I get, I get all of my potatoes from Bombay, India. <laughs> oh, why don't you get your potatoes from Idaho? Ten well, sure, warning. if you want to do it the easy way. Yeah. Uh, 10 minute warning. Uh, Cronenberg wrote the script for this movie 20 years ago, but he, but then he gave up on making the film and then he found the script again and he made the film. He didn't bother to rewrite it. Not one word. Okay. And, uh, I'm sorry. He Maybe he should have taken that. another pass at the script is yeah. all I'm saying. Uh, <clears throat> there were rumors when this movie premiered at Cannes, rumors of people walking out, people disgusted, but like, this movie isn't disgusting. It's, it's worse than that. It's just a bit dull and kind of pretentious. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't particularly like it. And I, yeah, could, uh, I, I, I would like to find out a bit more and I could see myself watching it another couple of times or two to try to find out what people are saying and what the hell is really going on here. I'm, I'm kind of intrigued. Yeah. Hmm. Well, uh, I feel like I would have loved this movie if I were in my 20s. Yeah. Because at that point in time, I was seeking out indie films and foreign films and going driving like an hour and a half to go see some bizarre art film that's only playing in some small theater in Scottsdale somewhere. So it, but I'm in my 40s now. I don't have time for pre surgical sex and plastic eating. I just don't <laughs> I want to be entertained when I see a movie. And it just it wasn't entertaining. I found the, the premise to be intriguing, but. Yeah. It's done 
awkward and kind of boring. One thing that I did like is that the people are growing new organs in the future. And because they have a sickness called accelerated evolution system syndrome or a ease. <laughs> so the concept is interesting and intriguing on paper, but in reality, I just didn't care. Yeah. But fascinating to have a director just recycle a title like this. I don't know why he would do this. That's the only reason I could think of it. I could just think that it was just a publicity stunt. Yeah. That's the only thing that I can think of. Um, why don't you do publicity stunts the normal way and have uh, Chris Pine spit on people and get the May Queen all pissed off? I mean, also, worry, also maybe, maybe you thought like, well, you know, maybe I can get away with it. I mean, who knows about the first crimes of the future? That's probably it. Yeah. If anything, he's going to get people to go and watch the weird foot fetish uh, child raping movie from 1970. <laughs> uh, so that's all I've got this week for this week's film. We've got six minutes. We can do this. I believe in us. Bonnie, what are we doing next week? Okay. We are taking a hard left turn. To lighten things up a bit, because, you know, these movies Good. were both pretty heavy, and we just did the whole fucking coronavirus thing. Mm -hmm. And it's funny that you had said it, but next time's movie, American Graffiti. It is already on the cough cough. I am so excited about this because I believe that I have watched it a couple of times when I was younger on TV. It felt like once a month it was on TV some Saturday or some Sunday on TV all of the time. So I believe that I've seen it before, but I couldn't tell you when the last time was that I actually sat down and watched it. I think I was a very young child. I don't think I've seen it since then, and I've only seen the heavily edited television version. I'm excited to see this film. I I I I'm a fan. I'm a fan and of it'll, this film. And it'll and, be a nice change of pace from the last two episodes. <laughs> and it gives us an opportunity to trash George Lucas without oh, yeah. having to watch another Star Wars movie. Ah, oh, yes, thank you. Very so much. It's, so it's like a, a, a back door to some good old fashioned George Lucas hate. Heck yeah. That'll, oh, that will be fun. I believe this movie was made back in the before times in the long, long ago when he had a neck. Yes. <laughs> before he became no neck Joe. <laughs> so that's going to be next week we're going to be watching American Graffiti that's going to be fun but now that I'm looking back at this week the highs and the lows uh, Kristen Stewart the diarist the uh, diarist Joe Biden being as old as Casablanca I gotta say I think this has been a pretty good episode of the podcast this has been a damn good episode yes. Okay, good. I was hoping you'd say that because I, I, I felt the same way. But I didn't want to say anything because I feel like you're the person who makes that distinction and not me. And so, But yes, I concur with your assessment, good sir. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And on behalf of Mal and Eleanor and Maxwell and my wife, Natasha, who really helped out in the monologue, I just want to say thanks for listening and we will see you next week, you godless heathens. And you dish waffles and poopy tits. And you loot llamas. And you booty. And you booty? Man, okay. Okay. Do 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 do. Do 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 do. This is the Johnny Carson theme. Do 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 do. Get it up and do well, cut and print. And put it on a cookie. We lost the microphone for it.